Hey folks, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm Raul Moes, I'm the Miami Program Director at Knight Foundation, and we're here uh, in the great company of friends and partners uh, to have a good conversation about where Miami's startup ecosystem goes next. And so earlier today, Knight Foundation, in partnership with Startup Genome, released a report that took a look at Miami's startup community, kind of the journey uh, so far and how we perform compared to peer uh, cities across the across the world and it was really revealing it because it kind of confirmed what we've been seeing uh, for, for several years now that Miami's on this upward trajectory as an innovation hub and it also offered some really cool insights that we hadn't really measured before about where we might go next and so uh, today's conversation is meant to be the first of many it's meant to kick off uh, kind of a period of reflection and maybe a reorientation around how Miami can channel all the forces that are changing the world today from the COVID pandemic uh, to the urgent task of creating more equitable systems across the nation uh, to really move forward as a place where high impact, high growth entrepreneurship survives and thrives. And so uh, to help us in that task, uh, we've got a few friends uh, on deck. Um, we'll do a quick round of intros and then we'll hand things off to Will Weinrob, who's OG Miami Tech, uh, founder and CEO of Live Ninja, and also uh, uh, through and through a community builder uh, who's really stitched together uh, the, the best of the best of Miami over the years. And so, Jamie, if you kick us off, uh, we'll get started. Great. Thanks, Raul. Um, so my name is Jamie Farrell. I've had a string of exits in the ed tech space. Most recently, um, sold Trilogy, Trilogy Education for $750 million over four years um, and had about 400 plus employees down here in South Florida. So excited to be part of the conversation. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Jamie, for kicking us off and Raul. My name is Leanne Buchanan. I'm the founding executive director of Venture Cafe Miami. Um, for those that aren't familiar, we host the largest weekly gathering of innovators, entrepreneurs, and tech folks in Miami. But most importantly, we focus on really connecting the ecosystem across lines of difference, across silos, and really looking at ways that Miami can be more inclusive, accessible, and more diverse. Um, in the last four years, Venture Cafe has had well over 50,000 people check into our weekly gatherings and programs and been able to partner with over a thousand different organizations locally, nationally, and internationally. So we see ourselves as an organization that can be a connective tissue. And our role is just to align and amplify um, the other amazing uh, organizations and folks in the Miami innovation ecosystem. Awesome, thank you. Uh, I'm Nico, I'm the founder and general partner of Animo Ventures. We're a $60 million seed fund where we focus on leading or co-leading the earliest investment rounds. And we'll usually invest anywhere from $500,000 up to 2 million in companies raising 500,000 up to four. Um, previously, I started Miami Angels, which is our local angel group here. Uh, and yeah, very, very excited to be part of this conversation. All right, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Will Weinrob, uh, born and raised here in South Florida. Uh, so very prideful of our city and all the changes, transformations that it's been going through. Uh, most recently, I was CEO and co-founder of uh, Live Ninja, which was acquired a few years back by Netophone, where I now head up product marketing for them. Uh, I am also the founder of the Local Leaders Collective, another Knight Foundation-backed initiative uh, that provides peer support groups for local founders. As Raul mentioned, uh, my role today, and I'm, I'm honored to do so, is to moderate the conversation, and I'll try my best at that because we've got a lot of great topics to cover and only an hour to do so. But we'll give it our best shot. I uh, would like to thank you all for joining us today and also thank the Knight Foundation for putting together what should be an amazing conversation with some incredible people from our local startup uh, and entrepreneurial ecosystem. Um, for folks joining, uh, again, thank you so much. The way Zoom works for most of you that are probably familiar with Zoom because it's like baked into our lives nowadays, uh, Zoom has a Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. So please, as the conversation is happening in real time, please feel free to drop your questions. Uh, we'll pick some questions that are maybe timely throughout the conversation, but we'll definitely get to a lot of questions towards the, towards the end of the conversation. So. Without further ado, without further ado, Ro, are we ready to kick it off? Awesome, thumbs up. All right, so I wanna kick things off with venture capital uh, and fundraising, as that's always a hot topic and one that many people tuning in are probably very interested in. Uh, and being that we're talking about VC, Nico, I'd like to start with you 
And I'd like to tie it into a very timely topic that I know a lot of people are very passionate about. Uh, we often hear and see in the data that black, brown, women founders receive a minuscule share of total venture capital deployed in any given year. We also regularly hear from VCs that state that they don't see enough deal flow from underrepresented founders in order for them to make up a larger part of their portfolios. In your opinion, how do you reconcile those two things? And I wanted to start with you because I know you're taking a very active role in this and are actively thinking about ways to mitigate those issues. Yeah, um, I'll start off with saying I, I obviously don't have the answer. I have uh, a bunch of thoughts. Um, I think, I, I think at the core, it's who are the venture capitalists, right? Because uh, I'm a big fan of you know, thinking fast and slow and Daniel Kahneman and all the research on biases. Um, et cetera, which you know, we're basically prisoners of our biases. And so if most of VCs end up being, uh, you know, white males, then naturally they're going to gravitate towards investing in white males. Um, and their deal flow is going to come from there and, and their referenceability and the warm intros and everything. It's kind of like a self-fulfilling circle, right? Um, and then the big exits are going to come there. So that kind of reinforces the cycle that, you know, it's, the young, you know, college dropout tends to be a white male that can is going to be make the best entrepreneur. Um, so I think at the core, it's you know how do we how do we change the, the the makeup of who the investors are themselves, right? Because if you look at the the number of dollars going to these uh, underrepresented communities, are very small. But then also if you look at the number of investors coming from these communities, is also comparably. Um, small, right? So I think in our case, you know, we're, we're three immigrants and our portfolio is two thirds diverse, right? Which means that we've got a bunch of immigrants, we've got a bunch of women, um, much higher than, than, than industry averages. Um, but we still don't, you know, haven't invested, you know, we're 13 companies in and we still haven't invested in our black founder. Um, and, and so that's why, you know, we've been spending a lot of time uh, trying to understand and you know, kind of on the learning and then on the actions, like what can we do concretely so that we can get uh, more embedded um, in the black community specifically? Um, because if I'm not, if we're not seeing all founders, we're not doing our jobs right. And I'm not fulfilling our fiduciary duty to, to our investors. Um, even if we are, you know, two thirds of our portfolio companies are diverse and that's like much larger, it's, it still means that we're not seeing 100% and that's a problem. Yeah, Leanne, I would love to get your thoughts on this as well. Uh, you know, for folks that are listening on the call, Leanne wrote an incredible piece on the Miami Herald recently that was published, uh, sharing her thoughts and perspectives, but we'd love to, to hear what you think and ways we can bridge this gap. Thanks, Will. Um, I think piggybacking off of what Nico said, um, to me, it boils down to two important considerations that may seem a little bit counterintuitive. So the first piece is trust. And um, last year, Venture Cafe partnered with many of the organizations here to host something called Capital Days, where we were really focused on how do we look at this problem around more inclusive deployment of capital. And we realized it's not about the data. We all know what the data says. So like 1% of venture back founders are black, 0.006% of women-led startups, uh, black women-led startups actually receive funding. And over 93% of VC firms um, have no black investment partners. So we know what the data says, but when it boils down to it, it's really about trust and access. So on the trust side, um, I think practically speaking, thinking about building relationships that are not just, I'll drop some money in a fund where the GPs are black VCs, looking more at um, translating relationships from being transactional to actually relational. Thinking about the way that Black founders, for example, are actually supported. Once you put dollars in, everybody knows this. Jamie, you know this. Raul, you know this. Will and Nico, it's not just about putting dollars in, it's actually what happens after the dollars. So follow on funding, how you get them to scale up so you can actually realize your ROI. So that trust piece is really important. So focusing on the relational and then access is, is the other piece. Um, where, where are we sourcing deals from? What is our kind of process or wayfinding around sourcing deals? If you are looking at co-investing with a predominantly um, black VC led fund, is it just one or do you have multiple sources where you're actually looking um, at, at deal flow? And I think the last thing is stop thinking about founders of color as a handout. 
or that it's a help piece. And I'm just going to be real here. We're leaving money on the table when we're failing to be more inclusive in how we deploy capital. For example, you know, Black people make up $1.2 trillion in spending power. That's a huge, like, I'm just about dollars and cents. That's a market opportunity. That is a missed market opportunity. And VCs are all about dollars and cents. It's about money. So stop leaving money on the table by, by you know, being tied to implicit bias in the way that we view investing opportunities, um, potential solutions and deals. And then the other piece is really around millennials. Millennials are kind of the largest uh, group in the United States right now, and they're increasing, increasingly black, brown, and Asian. So looking at what our consumer market trends are, we just need to do better on the investing and funding side because the consumers want these products. The consumers want these founders. The consumers want to support a more inclusive slate of growing companies. So I think it's time for VCs to kind of wake up. You know, well, I'll, I'll, plus one to Leanne's being real here, and I'll give sort of an operator perspective. Nico's already sparking. Um, and, and what I would say is this, and, and um, you know, in order to raise funds, in order to build a startup, like you're gonna get a hundred no's, right? No matter who you are, you're getting a hundred no's. And if you're gonna be successful, post your series A and post your series B, and you're gonna crush it, like, your mindset is always going to be, this is on you as the operator, right? And so what I would say is, do the, v, do the VCs and myself, I'm an angel investor. I, I'm looking for more ways to increase the diversity of my investments, right? Um, but I also, as an operator, um, do believe the way to be successful is hustle, and never, ever, ever giving up. And so I think if you reframe this, right, VCs, no offense, Nico, definitely, um, you know, opportunity uh, to improve. But I also think on the operator side, like, no matter who you are, this is a startup, right? You just keep pushing. And don't get me wrong, there are certain people, um, white males that may or may not have uh, or likely do have more access. And, you know, to Leanne's point, it's data. We already know that, right? Put your head down and go. Eventually, somebody's going to say yes. Love Just that. an op, you know, different perspective. Love that perspective. Roa, any thoughts? Yeah, I, I think um, as someone, uh, so I succeeded in Nico and Miami Angels uh, a few years back before joining Knight Foundation. And I think the kind of Leanne touched on this before, and we've talked about it separately, like what gets deals done, right? It's trust. Uh, it's trust, it's familiarity, it's social capital, it's who you know and how you know it. And so the angel group, uh, while I was there, like it was just easier for me uh, to bring people to the table as members of angels um, who I already had in my social network, right? You, people I had worked with before, et cetera, et cetera, so from my community. And so the, 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 the conscious effort has to be made uh, to, to build out uh, groups, um, tables that look like community, right? And so like, I look back kind of uh, at that time and I, I think halfway through the year, I look back and said, oh, like, look at the numbers, they're phenomenal. We've grown X percentage in terms of members, in terms of capital deployed. And then you kind of break it down in terms of, well, like, who did you recruit? And it's like, oh, I recruited a lot of folks that I had already done business with before and some new folks, but, but generally speaking, it didn't look like Miami on the net. It looked more like the community that I was coming from and not Miami as a whole. And so I think the, the calling out constantly of who's at the table and does the table look like the city, uh, does it look like the community, that's critically important, right? It's a great starting point. And then from there, I think you can say, all right, we've got folks at the table, that's not enough, right? Just having a seat at the table is not true inclusion. It's making sure that folks have the right ability and, and, and the ability period uh, to contribute and participate in the dialogue that's happening at that table, right? Beyond the tokenism of, oh, we look at our table, look how shiny it is, like, okay, like, how's that conversation functioning? So. Um, whether you're an angel investor or an angel investment group or at a VC, um, I think who's at the table really matters and informs the kinds of deals and the kinds of, of opportunities that you see that come across the, uh, the pipeline. Thank you, Raul. Uh, one question that just came in relevant to the topic. Uh, as a black male with a startup, what resources or organizations in Miami should I consider to have access to potential investors and or support? And I'll open it up for the panel. Everyone wants to jump in. So Leanne will give the real answer. The operator answer is everyone. Anyone that has a checkbook, 
That's who you should target. I have to co-sign on Jamie's answer, everyone, but with the caveat, who you can get connected with. So be strategic. Look to get connected with these folks, and I will talk about this later, but look to get connected with people that can open doors of opportunity for you. Just because you don't have that connection doesn't mean that someone in your, you know, six degrees of Kevin Bacon network has a relationship. So things like um, Code Fever, Black Tech Week. Excellent, accessible resource. Black Angels Miami. Uh, that's a great resource. Um, the other one that I can think about, you know, Beacon Council is a pretty good resource in trying to get, um, instead of just getting a check, sometimes you want like clients. You might want to connect with larger corporates that you could do business with and be able to demonstrate traction that will get you a larger check. And then, of course, obviously plug for Venture Cafe Miami because we are here to connect you. But um, I would also just be strategic about your connection. So don't waste time as money. And you don't want to waste your time running around like a chicken with your head cut off, but be strategic. I would say if you can get in touch with Jamie, that's a good connect. <laughs> yes. And um, what I'll say is uh, Miami is, is a very special tech community because it's very tight knit. Um, and so you can probably get to almost anybody you want in a couple of weeks. So just start reaching out and ask. Be like, hey, Jamie, I saw that you're connected to Leanne. Can you, you know, could you do an email intro? And nine times out of 10 or 99 times out of 100, you know, that will go through. And I can't stress Leanne's point enough about being strategic. Um, in this day and age, you know, especially active investors, either angel or institutionals, have their preferences and, and what they invest in pretty uh, clearly laid out either on, you know, Twitter or LinkedIn or their websites. And so just don't waste, don't waste your time. Like, I'll, you know, we are very incredibly narrowly focused in what we do. And yet I'll still get, you know, a, an email a week about like, hey, I'm, you know, I'm buying a couple of Popeye's franchises, you know, are you interested in investing? It's like, it's not what I do. It could be a great business. So save yourself the time um, and then just, you know, ping, ping people away for intros. I think Miami is a special place and, and how quickly that can, that can get you to everybody. Yeah, agreed. And I'll co-sign what you said, Nico. Uh, Miami is a very welcoming city. This community, this entrepreneur startup ecosystem, I, I feel we're very much still in the phase where a rising tide lifts all ships. We're happy to connect. Uh, I think everybody here on the panel can raise their hand and co-sign. Please reach out to us, right? If there's anything we can do to help, our emails are open, uh, LinkedIn, whatever the case may be, Twitter. Um, so please do reach out. Uh, if there are still more questions on this topic, please feel free to list them. We'll get to them towards the end, but we do need to keep the conversation moving. Uh, talent, another passionate topic we need to get into. Uh, we hear from many entrepreneurs and founders that there simply isn't enough of the right talent here locally in Miami. And now we're entering this whole new phase of how to deal with talent, hiring and retention in a post COVID world. Uh, most you know companies are now making the shift to remote employment and all this stuff. So, Jamie, as more folks think about living somewhere other than the city that their employer is based in, especially in tech, what do companies in Miami need to do today to attract and retain that exceptional talent that is on the market right now? Um, thanks, Will. Good question. So, how do companies attract and retain talent, uh, specifically in Miami? So, the first thing I would say is, you know. I don't look at attracting talent um, or retaining talent any different than I look at a potential acquisition, right? Whether it's a business or a person, you're either going to buy it or you're going to build it, right? There is, there's not really an in-between. And so in Miami, what it feels like is we hear a lot, um, and certainly I've said this, um, we can't match the packages in San Francisco or everybody wants to be in New York or there's just that, not that kind of money here you gotta learn how to build it, right? And I think talent breeds talent. And so, Will, if you're asking for a couple of different ways, um, I think one, there's, nobody wants to hear this, but it's patience. As more companies exit, right? There's going to be repeat founders, there's gonna be more people that have experienced at different levels, um, different growth trajectories. And so I think you'll get talent as more and more companies down here exit. Um, so that's, you know, patience and or poaching. I would go with poaching. Um, so that's one. I think two, you know, and this is something really interesting and um, this could be biased because I've only ever worked um, in businesses that 
are, you know, sort of 100% mission driven. But, you know, I think when founders and early stage companies down here talk about what they do, um, it is far more compelling to talent anywhere to frame it um, in terms of what the larger mission is. So why do you do what you do? Right. And if you look at the companies that have sort of broken out as successful down here, even in the last year or two, um, you know, Trilogy, right? We sold, like, we effectively changed people's lives for a living. That is what we did, right? Every day we knew that there were 100 people whose lives we changed that day. Pop up, another breakout, right? They don't have a problem getting talent. Why? Well, guess what they do? Like, they, I don't know, I mean, increase the quality of life for elderly people and arguably increase the longevity at some point. Baby sparks, right? Education, uh, parent educate, like these are all, you know, highly mission driven organizations. And I think as more and more companies and founders learn um, how to present a more compelling vision which I think will happen over time, and more people understand the why, that's what gets talent, right? It's that. And then the third, uh, the third bucket, even though you go back to buy, if you can't afford to buy it on salary, come up with great equity packages, right? So, um, you know, I'm a strong believer and have always given every single employee a pretty decent amount of equity. Um, and I think once that happens and once somebody sees what equity can do, they're gonna, it's again, it goes back to talent breeding talent. It becomes like part of the culture here. Nico, would love to get your perspective uh, and you know, what are some of the things you're seeing with your portfolio companies and how they're, they're going about this? Yeah, I think that the, the biggest shift since COVID started in, in March is kind of the, the new normal, whatever it may look like, it'll for sure be more distributed. And I think Miami uh, stands to gain from that. Right, just in the past month, I've gotten about 12 calls from, from people I know in either New York or SF inquiring about Miami. They're like, look, if I don't need to be stuck in, you know, paying high taxes in, you know, high real estate, like why should I stay in Manhattan? Like, I, you know, I'll, I would love to come spend time in Miami and move to Miami. So I think that's, that's a huge, I think the remote first um, or however you want to frame that whatever's going to happen over the next 12, 18 months, I think Miami stands to gain from that. Um, the other thing I'll say, kind of back to, to Jamie's poach um, strategy is we have two very well-funded companies in Miami that have uh, brought thousands of awesome talent down here. Whatever the outcome may be with those companies, some of them are struggling, but every startup struggles at some point. Um, I think a lot of those people got a taste of the South Florida lifestyle. And if the companies don't do well, they'll want to stay. And if, if the companies do well, then they'll have some money so that they can become either angel investors or bootstrap founders. If the companies don't do well, well, you know, they'll want to look for jobs and they don't want to go work for corporate, right? Because they're startup people. And I think that that'll be a very interesting talent. Group. So I think I'm very optimistic on kind of the accessibility and availability of talent for companies here. Yeah, and do you share similar thoughts on that? I know through Venture Cafe, you have a lot of visibility into this with different startups you work with. So we'd love to hear your perspective. So I may be a bit of a detractor. So I definitely agree with what Jamie and Nico said. But I think that, you know, talent, the question of talent is really a tale of two cities, right? And I think if we're talking about talent, we have to be really honest about like what type of talent are we talking about? I think to your point, Nico, I'm very optimistic about like high tech talent or folks that are well equipped to work in some of these um, scale uh, focused startups. Um, but there's a whole bunch, a whole swath of our population that has still has trouble finding high quality employment, still has trouble finding upskilling opportunities. And, you know, we have to be real. There are systemic inequities that limit um, the trajectory of your individual talent journey in Miami that are very real, they're very protracted, they're very present. And so I think that the conversation around talent has to be a little bit more um, diverse in terms of what we mean when we're talking about talent. Um, the other thing that I would say on the Venture Cafe Miami side is that, you know, there's some, there's some interesting opportunities around talent to really look at um, 
where you leverage those connecting organizations in sourcing talent and identifying talent in being able to vet um, talent because they've had an opportunity to engage outside the traditional hiring process. So I do think that there's more of an ecosystem that we need to build around talent and there's some significant gaps. I think about a lot of black software engineers that have left Miami because they couldn't find a job. And so that may not be necessarily the available availability of a position, but that access point or, or roadmap or opportunity pipeline just doesn't exist the same way it exists for some folks as it does for others. I completely agree with Leanne. There's systemic issues, and I mean that there's systems, right? The systems as they're structured, and it's not one system, it's interlocking systems that reinforce one another, right? And amplify one another for better and for worse um, that, that we really need to, to, to kind of look at uh, as, as a community as society. I think that's part of the conversation that's happening right now. I, I did want to elevate something that Jamie had shared around kind of equity compensation, because that was actually the, something that was in the report uh, that Startup Genome compiled and that hadn't been really measured before. And so it's, it's basically uh, an assessment, a measure of how many companies, what percentage of startups in South Florida offer all of their employees equity compensation, so stock option participation, compared to their peers. And, and what we see is that Miami has a really kind of big gulf compared to, to other emerging places like Atlanta or, or Austin uh, in terms of how many companies here give all employees, not just senior employees, but all employees equity comp. Um, and one, it was interesting because we've never measured that as Miami before. So now we have a benchmark that we can track against and compare it to the cities. But the other piece of that is that the, the Delta is so big um, that, that I, I do think it's one of these kind of questions of, of the maturity of the market, right? Miami is a really young market when it comes to this kind of, of, of venture activity. And so I wonder as we go on in, in the coming years, as more companies kind of uh, grow and, and mature, will we see more of them offer all their employees equity compensation, which ultimately leads to more uh, evenly distributed wealth creation, uh, which we want to see. Um, and that also has to kind of kicks off a virtuous, um, a virtuous kind of cycle, right? A virtuous cycle whereby um, not only do you have better talent coming down because they're getting equity compensation at all levels of the company, but then as wealth is created at all levels of the company when there's an exit, to Nico's point, um, those transactions generate new angel investors, new funds, et cetera. Um, so that's, that's one piece I think you're totally right on, on Jamie. Um, Miami has a room to grow in terms of best practices when it, when it comes to uh, attracting and retaining folks. Those are all great perspectives. Uh, would like to take a question from the audience. Uh, someone writes in, is it just me or does it seem like tech salaries in Miami are lower than other cities comparable uh, with cost of living? Is it a funding issue? Are local companies factoring the value of our beaches into their compensation calculus? Uh, so just uh, what are your thoughts as far as our tech salaries? It always kind of comes up in, in comparison to obviously the Valley and New York and Boston and even places like Austin. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I'll open it up for anyone in the panel to jump in. Jamie, you, you've built companies down here and Nico, you're investing in companies down here. So you're seeing the panel. What do you, what, what do both of you think of, of that? question. And, I'll, and if I can, I'll, I'll tie into another question uh, that Mariana uh, added, uh, which was, do we think that Miami will gain more talent or lose more talent with remote first? And so I think there's, there's, there's questions, those questions kind of can, can be bundled together uh, as companies reprice uh, salaries according to geography. So Raul, I think, you know, the reason I didn't respond um, was because I, I don't know what the data says, right? And so without the data, I'm happy to give an opinion and share what we did um, with a preface that no idea if I'm right or wrong. Um, and so I would say a couple of things, um, you know, so we did not and tried and did not and could not hire the tech talent that we wanted down here. Um, not saying we tried, we did anything, maybe we did it wrong. I'm sure that there were things we could have done better. Um, but that's how it didn't work for us. Now, the approach that we took, um, and this is where I think, again, once you have more experienced founders um, starting companies, the approach that we took generally for hiring jobs, including tech talent, was not what are other markets paying. That's one piece. It's what is the ROI we're going to get from this position, right? And if you start looking at things like that, and at an early stage company, if you're building incentive packages that do include things like equity milestones based on getting, I'm 
0.2% more efficient on your sales conversions because of the Salesforce process flows, guess what? You're going to get a pretty excited Salesforce admin, um, which is a role that we actually got somebody to move here for. So again, I think it goes back to being creative um, and the experience piece. So I don't know what the data says, um, but that's you know been my experience. Uh, I'll add to that. So we only have, out of the 13 companies that we've invested in, we've only invested in one Miami company. And that Miami company has been fully remote from day one. Uh, I think they've got four people that live here. Um, so I'm, I'm on the Jamie camp here that I just don't, don't have the, the, you know, the real data to have a smart opinion. All right. Uh, so just moving on. And I, and I think that's, this is an important conversation that still needs to happen, especially again, in this post COVID world where again, it's almost like the playing fields have kind of been leveled because now we'll be hiring people from all over the country. Remote work is much more accepted. So this is definitely something we need to look further into. So thank you for submitting that question. Um, another topic uh, that I'd like to discuss is finding a community. Uh, Miami is a very welcoming city, as we talked about, full of diverse people that come from all over the world. Uh, but it's also a very sprawled out city, right? Like we often hear that people that move into town, they have trouble finding the right community where they're living. Uh, and it's hard to get plugged into the right people. Leanne, uh, again, because Miami has a little bit of a reputation when it comes to finding community of like-minded folks, for someone new to town, to our startup community, how can they get connected to high quality, many times often unpromoted networks of peers? I think that's a good question. And I'd like to start off by maybe just kind of focusing in on the why we need community why we need communities of practitioners. I know the Startup Genome uh, Report had a, a really, some really good insights on the role of social connectedness. And I think that all of this on this call are evidence of why you need social connectivity in a startup and innovation context. But if you think about it historically, you know, we had chambers and we still have chambers, but the purpose of chambers were essentially to promote the interests of businesses. So in reality, the way people have connected, the way business people connect has changed, the way we do business has changed. You could have completely remote companies. You couldn't have that back when chambers were really kind of the, the only, um, only fish in the game. And so our culture is decentralized and increasingly siloed geographically, but also thinking about, you know, along other lines of difference. So I'd say in Miami, it is a very welcoming community. But if we're being real here, we know that high value networks are harder to penetrate. So it's very easy to get an introduction or a phone call, but when we're talking about that deep level of connectedness, community and real relationships that have kind of a degree of professional intimacy, reciprocal value where you can actually um, give, but also get from that relationship, it's a lot harder to penetrate and to find those things. The other thing that I would say is um, we have very few high value networks that transcend lines of difference. I think Raul, your example from the outset of the conversation on who you were bringing into AGP was who you knew, who you grew up with, who you did business with. And so I think in Miami, if we're just going to be real, we can be honest about the fact that, you know, lines of difference are what um, encapsulate our social networks. And I think the third thing that we know about Miami, so true, is it's almost more important to have a who you know approach than what you know. I personally think it's both what and who, but in Miami, who you know will often get you a lot further than what you know. And so with those things in mind, I think about the role of Venture Cafe. We've seen over 50,000 folks kind of connect with the Thursday gathering, which is truly open sourced. Um, and the number one piece of feedback that I get is that it's hard to break in. And the number two piece of feedback that I get is, yeah, it's great to network, but I want something of substance something that's niched, something that's industry specific, or something that allows me to connect with people that are not only in the same space, but at the same level, or a little bit further ahead of me so I can learn from that relationship. And so practically speaking, I think that for folks that want to get connected, obviously, you know, um, Venture Cafe is a good landing plaid, not as much as before when we were in person, where you kind of navigate the cafe space, but virtually we're still seeing a couple hundred people every single week connect in online spaces. But I think practically speaking, reframing how we think about opportunity to build community. I think traditionally we've thought about transactional relationships. So you build community by what you can get 
or how many people are in your LinkedIn network. And so I think us as kind of pillars of the ecosystem, if you will, it sounds like a, you know, a superhero movie, but for those of us in those leadership positions, we need to think about how we be a little bit more proactive in our outreach outreach to other markets to then recruit new folks, but also outreach outside of our individual circles. So it's the same model where, you know, one of my mentors, whenever she would go to the city, because she held a leadership position, she brings someone from Boys and Girls Club, or she brings someone that wasn't connected to that space. So I think the plus one approach is something that we can do as leaders to help people find community in a more authentic way. The second thing I would say is, um, and we've kind of talked about this offline, was like, we just need some objective roadmaps. I think it's easy enough to break into Miami, but it's very hard to connect with people that can actually value and be transformative in your life. And so having those objective roadmaps that are not just like a LinkedIn list, that literally is like, if you are in ed tech, you need to speak to Jamie, if you are in VC and you want to connect um, to specific founders from Latin America, you need to speak to Nico or Melissa Medina and Felici at Emerge. So having that objective like playbook, a who's who um, would really think, I think help out. And then the last thing is just like being transparent about how connections are made. Sure, you can go to networking events and think that, you know, by chance you'll run into the right person. But let's be real, they're made at these kind of dinners, um, you know, the history of the non-group, like these, you know, regular breakfast, lunches, and dinners that are typically not advertised. You're not going to see it on Eventbrite. You're not going to see it on Facebook. But um, those are the places that I think are what we really need to think about redistributing our social capital and reallocating social capital. So, Leanne, so I'm just going to... So, um... So I just went through this and a year ago, I didn't know one person on this call and probably none of the, no one that's watching either. And so I will tell you as somebody who went through this, who has built a career based on networking and building relationships, Miami was the hardest, one of the hardest places to break in um, that I have ever encountered. And frankly, had I not, I mean, as much as I hate to build his ego, had I not spoken to Nico, I was done. I was like, I was like, I'm sticking with New York. No, really. I mean, I was flying to and from New York two to three times a month because it was, that's where my network was. Um, and so, you know, I think there's a couple of things. I mean, I've learned a ton down here over the last year, um, especially from, you know, the folks in Miami. And, um, you know, to your point, Leanne, and we talked about this, like, yes, there needs to be like, a, I always call it a playbook, right? But a playbook. But I also think there needs to be like what I would call um, like a community commitment. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, on my LinkedIn profile for years, and it's still there, I wrote, if you're interested in changing the world through education, I'm interested in a conversation. And I will talk to any person that reaches out. Um, I get told it's not efficient. Guess what? It's worked for me. And so as we're sitting here, I was like, you know what? I don't want anyone to have to go through the shit that I went through and I'm pretty confident, right? So like, um, you know, I will probably after this do, you know, Nico does this very well. He puts his Calendly out there. Um, I am not doing that, but I do think literally anyone that's in the community, like why not put on your LinkedIn profile? Want to know about South Florida? Give me a call, right? Because the reality is like, the people that do, they're gonna matter. That's who we want. They're gonna help us build the community and the ecosystem. We have a responsibility to do that. I think I just gave my action item. <laughs> yeah, just, just on that. So I try to make myself available. I'm, I'm pretty easy to find. Uh, you can just book time. And it's, it's on my pinned on my Twitter feed. Um, my email's almost anywhere. I get so much spam as a result of all of that. Like actual spam, not people wanting to meet. Um, and I, you know, I, I do my best, right? Um, and, and I think that different uh, people can do different things, right? And so I am much more on a one-on-one, -on -one, like let's jump on a call for 20 minutes. Um, I think as, as, as a VC, you get to see under the hood of a lot of things. And so um, I think we have a lot of shiny objects in Miami. And, and so th th there's a disillusionment process that a lot of people go through because shiny objects, you know, you're obviously attracted to shiny objects first. And so you start to engage and there's nothing there. 
And so your heart breaks and you know you keep going. Um, and as a VC, because we've either looked at a lot of these companies or we've engaged with a lot of these players, um, we have, I don't know, like historical uh, information. And I think I can share that in, in kind of a 20 minute call, like when Jamie and I connected as, as she was um, engaging more. And so if, if I'll make that available to anyone listening, um, if you ever want kind of more background on, on or what I've seen in the last five, six years in, in Miami Tech. Again, my calendar is, is open. I, I, can, can I just I jump in? Go for it, Leanne. Go for it. So just really quickly, um, Jamie, I love the community commitment thing. I never thought about that, yet people reach out to me all the time. So about to make that a new new commitment. But I think the other the other challenge um, as we think about like the access points is um, is knowing who to connect with multiple times. So a lot of times you do an intro call, but there's also that responsibility around like follow up. How are you going to keep engaging someone? So they're not like you where you're like, I did this for like a while and I was ready to give up. And so I think it's incumbent upon us to create like those feedback loops. So those regular points of contact, you know, uh, with people that are new, with people that are breaking in so that they don't feel like it's like a one and done, that it's actually like, Again, a relational approach. Relationships are not built in one meeting. They're, they're made after multiple times of contact. Sorry, Raul, I just wanted to add that point. I think that's exactly, that. I'll pick up from there in terms of relationships, right? Um, oftentimes when we talk about emerging startup communities, we talk about the hard assets, the hard infrastructure that makes them go, right? And, and fundraising, capital, right? Financing are, is essential, money is essential, as is talent. Those are, are two kind of givens. Um, but we've seen a ton, uh, and Startup Genome kind of, kind of confirms this, we've seen a ton of places where you have those raw materials or you have the hard infrastructure, uh, the equivalent of kind of a city's electric grid or, or water and sewer infrastructure, but there's no life or there's very little life, right? And, and you get Jamie's experience, right? Where you had someone with incredible operating experience um, in, in building multiple high growth companies that have exited, but couldn't find tribe, couldn't find community, couldn't find peers, uh, to, to live, work, and play with. And so the, the charge, I think, for us in terms of, of where we go next uh, as a community really is about building up that soft infrastructure that, that you mentioned, Leanne, right? These, these dinners that are happening, there's a reason they continue to happen, right? It's because people find value in, in building rapport with, with folks who, who they break bread with. And so I think, how do we expand that pie? How to expand that experience, include more folks? Um, how do we create different experiences that are comparable in terms of outcomes, but maybe aren't the hoity-toity dinners at exclusive restaurants, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think that soft infrastructure creates, right? The, what, what we would call the, maybe in, in the city, would be the, the green space or the public, uh, the parks or the, the museums that give life, right? That bring energy and make a place livable and, and, and contribute to this lifestyle kind of quotient. I think those are the things that Miami's uh, startup community right now has a huge opportunity in, um, especially kind of to, to Mariana's question about what we, stand to gain or lose um, from remote work and what's happening now. I'm, I'm a big believer that there's, there's a lot of chatter for sure, a lot of noise about people looking in, in, to move in different places. I don't know if it's gonna be a flood, but we've definitely seen both in, in data and anecdotally um, an uptick in the kinds of people, kinds and number of people that are choosing to be here. And if we don't kind of make a really concerted effort, community commitment, if we will, to welcome those folks, to help those folks find their community, their peers, I think the loss there is that in two or three years, I'll say, you know what, I tried it, great quality of life, but I couldn't find anybody to, to, to work with and play with, so I'm heading back to New York City, right? So I think Miami, unlike most other cities in the country right now, has the unique ability to retain the people who are choosing to be here, right? We're not Tulsa in that we have to kind of incentivize you with a $10,000 bonus. No, people are choosing to be here because we've built a really cool city over the last decade and, and change. Now, how do we keep them? What keeps them here is attached. What attaches them to place is other people. We got to make those, make sure those relationships and bonds uh, uh, occur. They stick. Awesome. Oh, those are all, all great answers. So we're making good time. We have about 15 minutes left. So at this point, I'd like to open it up to Q&A for the, the folks in the audience that are writing in some really terrific questions. So we'll kind of jump all over the place in, in the topics that we've covered so far. Uh, Let's go back to talent real quick. Somebody writes in, uh, there seems to be a disconnect between the talent and companies. As I've heard mature companies say, I can't find the talent I need in Miami. And I've heard talent say, I can't find the companies that will hire. 
Why is that after so many years of, uh, in Miami and, uh, and finding tech talent, why is that still an issue? Where is that disconnect coming from? I think you know, as somebody that hired a bunch of different, uh, a lot of people down here, um, what we learned very quickly was um, somewhere like New York City, it is very easy to say, this is the skill set that I want. And I think one of the best learnings that we had um, that will drive every business that I run in the future was you don't hire for skills, right? Like you don't hire for skills early on or you don't hire only for skills, right? Um, at a high growth startup, like I was probably our first 20 hires, I don't know what their skills were. Hustle, heart and learning. And so I think there, the gap will is not necessarily, I think there's a piece of it, employers know what they want, right? Or they think they know what they want and they want it now, they don't wanna to have to build it, right? So it's the short-term versus the long-term gratification. Um, and I think people that are looking for different companies, um, I don't think companies do a good job um, branding themselves at all, right? And how they're different and what the differentiators are and put themselves in sort of different places. Um, and not just indeed. Um, so I think the disconnect um, is really due to, I mean, many things, but really those two, two things. Like when you, you know, we spent, so my last business was literally based on building talent. And so my job was to speak to pretty much every CHRO uh, in the Fortune 100 and startups. I mean, there, there weren't that many. Um, I spoke to a lot. And the one thing we heard repeatedly, um, and you can look at this anywhere, is, you know, soft skills are far more important than hard skills. We care about hiring for grit, learning, and confidence. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I certainly haven't seen anywhere down here that assesses for that. I haven't seen, seen many job descriptions except for maybe a couple on AngelList. I mean, we literally, and again, I'm a little bit um, off the reservation, but like our job descriptions, we were, I was literally, I was like, I want a badass hustler that has a heart of gold. That, I want somebody who can learn faster than I can. Like, and by the way, when you apply for this job, show me, demonstrate you can do those things, right? So I still think there is a little bit of, I'm gonna call it a, an old school hiring mentality down here um, that I think if we shifted a little bit, at least for us, we had no problem hiring hundreds of employees that were amazing. If I could just add to that, I think that there's two two different conversations, right? One is the mature company. So if, I don't know, if Uber needed to hire, you know, a thousand software developers in Miami, you know, potentially there, there's just not enough, a big enough pipeline to fill those thousand seats. I don't know. I haven't looked at data, but that um, intuitively, that sounds like that could be a problem. Now, the talent shortage that I don't buy is when you're a startup and you need to hire two people. If you're a startup in Miami and you can't hire two people, it's not the lack of talent. And, 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 and that's really tough, right? But that there's something about what you're offering, either the salary is really low, which was, you know, go, goes back to a previous question, or the equity compensation isn't there to adjust for the risk, or your company mission isn't attractive, or you as a leader, you know, just people don't want to work for you. And, and that is probably the hardest to come to terms with. But the point is, I think that, and, and we've seen startups that have broken out over the last, I don't know, five to 10 years. And at some point they knew they, they have needed to you know, start importing talent. But at that very beginning, if you tell me you can't hire two to five people, that's not in Miami. Uh, and that may be a bit of a contrarian take here. I mean, so I would say if you can't hire 200 people, it's, then I, there's a lot of people down here we have three big universities, like. I think to Jamie um, and Nico's point really quickly, uh, Will, is that there's a disconnect, but the disconnect is really around the expectations and what is communicated on either part, right? So people that are looking for jobs don't know how necessarily to demonstrate that they have more than a resume, that they're plugged in, that they're involved, that they're passionate, that they care. And they're probably not used to hiring processes where you actually have to show, not just tell. 
you know, with our internal process, we have a rock star team, never have a shortage of folks um, that are that were applying for the small amount of roles, but it was really easy to find because we um, go through a process, we actually have to show what you do. I think on the hiring side, the, the same thing goes. Um, I recruited, like I actually handpicked people. I went out to places where I knew that people that had those skills, I like have a watch list of folks that were like, I've been eyeing for years that I was like, oh, a role, I already know that you have the skills because I'm actively involved in the community. And so I'm able to identify a short list of people that I am personally reaching out to. So I think on the, the company side or the founder side, like we also have to do our jobs of being plugged in as much as we can, like you can still build, but be tapped into a network where you can get referrals, things like Talent Scout, a great resource. Um, and so I think that there's a bit of a disconnect around like the how, how both sides are approaching the problem and it just continues to, to create a larger a gap. That's a great answer. Thank you everyone for chiming in. Roel, do you, you have thoughts on this? Um, no, I, I, I agree with what folks have said. I do think that though that there's opportunity, especially in today's day, uh, to reimagine the marketplaces that bring talent and opportunity together, right? And so in a community like Miami, that's very young and nascent, density is low uh, on a per capita basis in terms of sometimes the, the talent that we're looking for, um, and, 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 and the ventures as well that, that talent would want to work for. And so I do believe that there's supply demand kind of discovery issues, right? I think they're both there, and I hear these things all the time. I can't find great companies, I can't find great talent. And I, I think one of the things that we're exploring at the foundation is what new models of marketplaces should we conceive of or could we conceive of and our communities trying out to bring those two sides together, right? Uh, and Dreesen Horowitz had a great kind of post recently about the great rehiring, uh, which will happen as, as we kind of come out of lockdown and how horizontal marketplaces for talent like an Indeed or a LinkedIn are gonna be challenged to competing against more specialized vertical marketplaces that specialize in nursing skills or logistics skill sets, et cetera, et cetera, because those vertical marketplaces help you cut through the noise faster. And so I think there's definitely an opportunity in Miami to, to innovate and, and to kind of come up with new models, new marketplaces that cut through the noise and help awesome talent kind of find great companies more easily. Awesome. Uh, I wanna get back to uh, diversity and inclusion. Um, Somebody writes in, a common pattern in work for inclusion is that leaders of color who value inclusion are asked to single-handedly lead efforts on diversity and inclusion within their own companies on top of doing the job that they were hired for. So often, diversity and inclusion efforts fall apart within companies because they are not sustainable for that person's workload without the mobilization of resources and people in the entire company beyond that one individual. It's a great point. How can we avoid the same pattern of burnout for individual leaders invested in inclusion in our innovation ecosystem? I hate to be the person that takes a stab at that at first, but I'm looking at the participants and I can almost guess who actually asked that question. Um, <laughs> but notwithstanding, you know, I think that's a real point that I think in this particular moment in time, we can have some real transparent, honest conversations. Like inclusion is not a one person job. It's an actual commitment that has to come from leadership. Some of us have, have, have had offline conversations around what that looks like. So I think, you know, in this moment, it's great for honesty around just saying, I don't know what to do. I know we need to do something, but as a leader, I have no idea what we should do, but it's also incumbent upon leaders to connect with each other and connect with the resources to learn. And then secondly, pay people. If you want someone to lead your DNI efforts, you need to add dollars and cents to their salary to compensate for what they are doing or pay consultants or pay the people that you're asking to like just pick their brain and help you create a framework on how you can be more equitable, diverse, and inclusive. And I think the last thing I would say about these efforts is they fall apart because they don't have um, buy-in in three forms. So there's not, the, you don't have buy-in in terms of the folks that have privilege, power, and influence actually taking a step back or providing um, that same level of power and influence to decision makers or people that are leading those efforts. So they don't have kind of buy-in within the whole organization. The second piece is there's no um, clear expectations or articulation around what are the strategic action steps by which the organization can be held accountable. So it's not just about metrics in a quantitative sense, but qualitative and quantitatively, like what's the game plan so that there can be accountability so people don't say, oh, we had a lunch 
how many lunches do we have this year? Um, and I think the third thing is um, putting money where your mouth is. I love to see the organizations that are following up their Black Lives Matter support statements with like dollars, like actual funds, but then thinking strategically about not just giving money, like throwing money at a problem, but coupling that money with a strategy and bringing in the right resources to ensure that it's a great impactful investment. Yeah, and, um, and and this is a conversation that Leanne and I had had offline. Um, I think the most important part is, is commitment at the top, right? So when uh, I, I, I go back to the Uber example from a few years ago when they had a very, very dark, deep uh, DNI problem, and what did they do? They just hired somebody. Right, but there was no change at the leadership. There was no, it's like they basically got a bunch of bad PR and said, all right, well, what's a counter PR headline? Well, we can say that we hired this awesome person that I think was com coming from whatever awesome university with whatever awesome track record that is specialist in this thing. And I think that person lasted in that role like six months, right? Because that commitment wasn't honest, it wasn't authentic, and it wasn't coming from, from the leadership. And so I think that DNI efforts will be, will have very short legs if leadership, which today is, you know, across different industries is mostly white, mostly male, um, doesn't have a, a day of reckoning or a conversation with the mayor and saying, look, what is it that, that we need to change in order to do this? Because this is not just a, a sticker that we can put on by, by hiring somebody, even if you pay that person really well, which you absolutely need to. Awesome. Uh, we are coming up at the end of this. We have a few minutes left. So just to, to, to recap and bring us in for a close here before we hand it off to Raul, who will sign us out. I'd just like to go around the horn to each of our panelists for one actionable item, takeaway, uh, you know, something of value that, that you could leave us with. Either this is an action item for you or a call to action for the community, which I heard a lot of, of great stuff here on this call. So real quick, just like to go around the horn and, and, and hear what those might be. Leanne, I'd like to start with you. I knew you were going to call on me first. So I'm trying to think about an action step. Um, here's like a, just a bit of a plug action step. Like we have been thinking at Venture Cafe how we can be more innovative around creating um, some connectivity on different efforts around addressing racial and equity innovation here in Miami. So we've got the survey. Please fill it out. It's literally who you are. Are you committed? What you can offer? What you need? So we can get some ideas on how we can be strategic. But I think the important thing is just collaborate. I think the best way to be equitable, inclusive, and diverse is to not stand on your own and be on your own island. So think about, you know, if you're doing programming, if you're doing sessions, what three or four organizations could you collaborate with? Um, because that, I think, is the first step when we get outside of our silos and begin to bring in other folks from diverse perspectives and diverse points of view. Awesome. Jamie? I think I would go back to what I said before, like the community needs to make a commitment, right? And I think there's like two very tactical and easy ways to do that. What, like go right on your LinkedIn profile. If you're interested in learning about South Florida, reach out. Very simple, takes 10 seconds. I think, and the way to manage that because, um, you know, that can take a lot of time. Um, I, like personally, I just do blocks. I do like a two 30 minute blocks every three days to talk to a certain type of individual. So like I'll do two, two blocks a week to talk to people that are coming into Miami. It's just time management and discipline. And like, I think, you know, everybody seems to talk a lot about doing this stuff. So I'll be really interested to see who actually changes their profile. I think I just threw out a challenge. <laughs> Nico? Yeah. Um... So we're, we're, we're doing a couple of things, right? One is uh, I've opened my calendar and I'm doing office hours specifically for black founders um, because a lot of what we heard was that, that there is an access issue. Um, and so we want to remove that barrier. That's one. Um, the second is internally at the fund, we have a learning objective every year where you go deep into something and then you educate the rest of the team on what you learn. Um, my annual uh, topic this year will be race relations in America because having not been born or raised here, uh, it's, it's something that is very different and, and new to me. Um, and then uh, kind of to Leanne's point, it goes, it goes down to dollars, right? So that there's that, 
the hashtag higher or wire um, that's going around on Twitter. Um, and, you know, we're looking to invest in, 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 in the best uh, founders and a lot of those will be black and we need to invest in black founders. So actively sourcing uh, companies uh, as diverse as possible. Um, and we're thinking about uh, potentially onboarding uh, an intern and we're still kind of, you know, internally thinking about how we can set that up because we're, we're a very small team of three people. So do we have the, the soft infrastructure internally as a firm to have that internship experience be a valuable one? Uh, so stay tuned on that. Um, it may or may not happen. All right, Raul. Um, folks, this discussion was absolutely uh, incredible. I, I really appreciate your time, your candid thoughts and insights um, and the experience that you bring to the table from, from each of the, the roles that you're playing in town. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm so enthused. I'm so excited. I'm so optimistic about what's happening. Um, I know there's crazy, crazy kind of um, uh, implications and questions uh, from, from the pandemic around uh, the state of the economy, who's benefiting, who's not. Um, but I really think that this kind of moment of reflection uh, is, is one where Miami can, can absolutely rise to the moment and, and further build what, what we've already accomplished in terms of, of creating a community uh, of entrepreneurs, investors, talent, um, that's creating high growth ventures, uh, high impact ventures, that's creating wealth uh, for more of Miami, um, and it's keeping a lot more folks in town in the ability to kind of stay and, and participate in the future of the city. So on the net, incredibly excited about this. Uh, I bow down to each of you uh, for the work you're doing uh, and, and continue, have done and continue to do, um, and truly grateful for, um, for what hopes, what I hope to be is just the first of many conversations of the summer um, that, that are uh, kind of, um, moments of, of reflection, as I had mentioned before, but also the moments of, of reorientation where we think there's, there's new growth. So a huge thanks to you, Will. Um, I had a colleague uh, slack me uh, halfway through the chat saying that she wants you to narrate her life. Um, so kudos to you. Uh, and thank you, Leanne, Jamie, Nico, uh, for being uh, so awesome and bringing your, your whole selves to this. Thanks, yeah. folks.